Throughout 1825, Ibrahim Pasha and his Egyptian cohorts had forcefully asserted themselves as the masters of the Peloponnese, while the Hellenic Republic, recovering from their very ill-timed civil wars, consistently failed to put up an organized defense. But all was not lost for the freedom fighters of Hellas. In this third episode of the Greek War of Independence, Missolonghi will fall and the natal Hellenic Republic will be beaten within an inch of its life. But their struggle will continue, and at their darkest moment, powerful allies, for better or worse, will come to their aid. It's the same deal with our sponsor for this video, Raid Shadow Legends, where the best part is that to defeat dungeon bosses you need to pool the skills of different champions together to make a team that's more than the sum of its parts. To help out with that and look good doing it, check out their Summer Splash event, with 5 new champions coming out this month, plus new skins for Trunder Guilt Mallet and countless other rewards. On top of that, they're also running the Deliana Chase event, in which you can get the new High Elf Legendary Champion Deliana for free if you log in and play raid for 7 days in a row between now and July 28th, an easy way to get one of the best champions in the game. And if you're a new player, you can use the promo code MYDELIANA to get 50 XP brews, that way you'll have your new champion at level 50 right away, and it comes with a pile of silver to sweeten the deal. And if you want more free stuff, then get the game via our link in the description or the QR code on screen to also get a $30 bonus package. The epic champion Tayril, 200,000 silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard, allowing you to summon more champions immediately. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. By now, only a few strongholds remained in Hellenic hands, one of which would be the stage of the most iconic battle of the entire war. Twice had the town of Missolonghi repelled Ottoman siege attempts, the second time famously resulting in the martyrdom of Lord Gordon Byron, English Greekabu Supreme. When Ibrahim Pasha's Egyptian regulars had landed in the south, and began their fiery march through the Peloponnese, they had bypassed Missolonghi, seeing it as strategically insignificant compared to the fortresses at Mithoni and Navarino. However, while Sultan Mahmud II was mostly content to let his autonomous Egyptian vassals spearhead this latest phase of the war effort, he would not have his own forces sit idly by on the sidelines. So it was that the sublime port, appointed one 45-year-old Qatahib Pasha as head of all Ottoman land forces in Romelia, and told him in simple terms that either Missolonghi would fall or the head would from his shoulders. Thus, while Ibrahim Pasha was conquering his way through Morea, Qatahib Pasha assembled an army in Jania and crossed the Pindos Mountains in spring of 1825, arriving before the walls of Missolonghi by April. The town was defended by a garrison of some 3,000 men. It was under the loose overall command of the Suyot captain Notis Botsaris, and composed mostly of Greek and Suyot Albanian warriors, alongside a small contingent of Italian and German Philhellenes. In comparison, Katahi Pasha had some 20,000 men at his disposal. 8,000 of these were professional soldiers, mostly of Turkish, Muslim Albanian or Bosnian stock although some wild Cossack mercenaries from the Danube region numbered among them. The rest were laborers and slaves, taken from the local Christian peasantry. Soon the battle was joined, but although Kataha outnumbered his foe greatly, he would find Missolonghi to be an extremely tough nut to crack. The town was protected by 6,000 feet of thick earthworks, prefaced with a large moat and stationed within strategic gun emplacements. By sea it was protected by a shallow lagoon and sandbanks which made it treacherous for Ottoman warships to directly approach. Indeed, Katahu's initial attempts to breach the town on both fronts were thwarted. Although Ottoman sappers were able to trigger a massive explosion underneath the earthworks on August 2nd, the following charge to take the ramparts, led by the Cossack mercenaries, was repelled by the Greeks. Meanwhile, attempts by the Ottoman navy to blockade the town by sea also ended in failure when the cowardly Kapudan Pasha, Kusrev, retreated at the sight of Greek fireships, fearing being caught in the shallows and trapped in the inferno. This allowed Missolonghi to continue receiving fresh supplies by boat. 
Despite all this, Qatahib Pasha refused to back down, and since his head was on the line, retreat was simply not an option. However, help was needed, and so Qatahib opened communication with the other invader in the Peloponnese, who thus far had enjoyed far more success against the Greeks. In November of 1825, Ibrahim Pasha's Egyptians arrived at Missolonghi, renewing the naval blockade by sea and bringing in fresh professional infantry and artillery by land. From here, the stubborn town's days were numbered. Within the next few months, the Greek ships resupplying and defending Missolonghi were scattered or sunk by the modern Egyptian fleet, cutting off the town's main lifeline. Still, the defenders refused to surrender, but theirs was a futile struggle. By March, they had begun to succumb to diseases born of malnutrition and realized that the walls that protected them were soon to be their tomb. Faced with no other option, Notis Batsaris and the other Hellenic leaders made a plan to break through the Ottoman encirclement and escape, abandoning the city itself but allowing the men within to live to fight another day. This would amount to a dramatic but ultimately disastrous final charge. On the 10th of April, the defenders burst forth from the town and began carving their way through the Egyptian Ottoman lines, but they were ultimately overrun. The Greeks and Suyots were slaughtered, and the invaders poured into the town, massacring its civilian male population and enslaving the women. For the Hellenic Republic, it was the single greatest military disaster of the war. After Missolonghi, the Hellenes were hanging on by a thread, but they were hanging on, for a handful of fortresses were still in revolutionary hands, like the provisional capital of Napoleon and the Acropolis at Athens. But the pressure was still on. Three months after Missolonghi's fall, Qatahu Pasha's army arrived at Athens and dug in for a siege. Ibrahim and his Egyptian land forces, meanwhile, roamed the Morea with impunity, burning villages and carrying off grain and livestock. However, the Egyptians had sustained heavy losses over the many battles he had won, rendering them without the manpower to take the remaining Hellenic fortresses. Consequently, the old bandit Kolokotronis continued to be a thorn in Ibrahim's side. Indeed, beyond the plains and in the hills, rebel activity was still strong, and Ibrahim's Arab corps ventured into them at the peril of being picked off by snipers. This inability to take mountainous territory was put on full display in June of 1826, when Ibrahim made the ill-fated decision to lead his armies into the Mani Peninsula. Even before the revolution, Mani had never really been under Ottoman occupation, and when Ibrahim sent an envoy who offered the Maniots death or surrender, the Neo-Spartans sent him back with a reply which would have made their ancestor King Leonidas proud. From the few Greeks of Mani and the rest of the Greeks who live there to Ibrahim Pasha, we received your letter in which you try to frighten us, saying that if we don't surrender, you'll kill the Maniots and plunder Mani. That's why we are waiting for you and your army. We, the inhabitants of Mani, sign and wait for you. Sure enough, the Egyptians found bitter weeds in Mani. The fortified mountain towns defied him, and at the citadel of Virgas, his 7,000-strong army was repulsed by 2,000 Maniot warriors and 500 assorted refugees from the rest of the Morea. More humiliating on his part was the attempt to pincer Virgas by the Bay of Deros, which had no warrior garrison. There, his soldiers were repulsed by a surprisingly fierce countercharge led by local elders and women the latter of whom became honorifically known as the Amazons of Deros. Thwarted once, Ibrahim launched a second invasion in August, but again he was pushed back, this time at the town of Polyaravos, where the Maniots killed 400 Egyptians, losing only nine men in the process. The continued struggle of Kolokotronis and the resistance of the Maniots were ultimately small victories compared to the loss of Missolonghi and most of the Peloponnese, However, they were important nonetheless, for they proved that Ibrahim Pasha's Egyptians, who had been virtually undefeated up until this point, were not invincible. Moreover, despite the heavy beating it had received, the revolution was still alive. Although public opinion in Western Europe 
had always been sympathetic to the Greek cause. The actual governments of those countries were extremely reluctant to get involved. Seeing the Hellenic rebels as a threat to the political security of the continent. However, by 1826, factors both internal and external were increasingly pushing the great colonial powers of Europe toward direct military intervention on the Greeks' behalf. By that point, public outcry against the slaughter of the Christians of Greece by Islamic soldiers was becoming too hard to ignore. This sentiment had snowballed after Western Philhellenes, like Lord Byron, began martyring themselves fighting for the Greek cause, and continued to do so after Missolonghi, as an unprecedented outpouring of sympathy from the romantic, educated masses of Enlightenment Europe grew into a force which governments could not ignore. Throughout the West, lobbyist societies began popping up to support the Greek cause, such as the Société Philanthropique en Favor de Grec in France, which was patronized by the powerful Duke of Orléans. Concurrently, painters, composers and playwrights utilized their voices to engender sympathy for the Greek cause. All over Europe, Philhellenism became a cultural phenomenon which unified diverse swaths of European society, a factor which eventually helped push their governments to action. As Britain and France inched ever closer to sending armies into Greece, individual Britain adventurers continued to go off to fight of their own accord. But no longer were these Philhellenes young students or romantic lordlings, but high-ranking decorated war heroes. Indeed, after Ibrahim's devastating military invasion, Greek leadership was in disarray, and as such, the struggling republic consented to allow members of the British military aristocracy to lead the Hellenic army and navy. Back in 1825, the London Greek Committee, the foremost Philhellene lobbyists in England, secured the private services of one Lord Thomas Cochrane. Long-time viewers of our channel will be intimately familiar with Lord Cochrane and his antics, a Scottish madman who was perhaps the single deadliest sea captain of the 19th century, having made mincemeat of France's warships during the Napoleonic Wars, only to run afoul of the British government and then go into exile in South America, where he played a critical role in helping Chile, Peru and Brazil win their respective independence wars. As Cochrane was sent to lead the Greeks by sea, so too was his counterpart, Richard Church, appointed to lead them by land. Church was an Irishman with roots in the Greek community. During the Napoleonic Wars, he had led an auxiliary regiment of the British Army, composed of ethnic Greek light infantry, to take the French-occupied Ionian Islands. Serving in Church's Greek regiment during this time was a younger Theodoros Kolokotronis. Indeed, the old warlord had great respect for his former British commander, and when Church arrived to command the Greek army, Kolokotronis is said to have remarked, At long last, our father is come. The two Britons immediately had a unifying impact on the Greek war effort. After Ibrahim's campaign of destruction, the Hellenic government had fallen back into their old rivalries. Mavrokodatos, the old ship of state, had gone into retirement after the fall of Missolonghi, and in his absence, the national assembly he built, then fought a civil war to unify, had split again into two rival factions of bickering politicians and warlords, based in Aegina and Castri, respectively. When Church and Cochrane landed on Greek soil in March of 1827, they both refused to accept office until the squabbling factions settled their differences, which they eventually did. With the Greeks now about as unified as they were capable of being, the two Britons took their respective positions as Admiral and Commander-in-Chief of the Hellenic Republic and went on the offensive. Their first mission was to relieve the Acropolis at Athens, which for nearly a year had been under siege by Katahipasha's forces. This, however, would not go as planned. Ironically, while Cochrane and Church were capable of unifying the Greek factions, they could not stand one another and were constantly butting heads. Their utter inability to coordinate or cooperate led to Kataha leading a successful sortie against Cochrane's advance force, which killed over 1,500 Greek soldiers. Seeing their relief army annihilated, the small garrison holding out in the Acropolis surrendered, 
and Athens fell back into Ottoman hands. It was yet another heavy setback for the Greek cause. But this was still not the end, for on the great stage on which the Concert of Europe performed, the gears of geopolitics had begun to turn. Where Britain's best military minds had failed the Greeks, their politicians would succeed. As much as the eventual intervention of the great powers in the Greek War of Independence was influenced by public sympathy, the core deciding factor was born of realpolitik. By the 1820s, there was a Russian-sized elephant in the room. The Tsar's influence in Ottoman affairs had been increasing since the 1770s, and as Western Europe watched Istanbul's territory gradually shrink at St. Petersburg's expense, an Eastern question arose. What would happen to the balance of power in Europe if the Ottoman Empire collapsed and Russia doubled its territory as a result? Fears of Russian expansionism had been one of the reasons Western Europe operated on a strict policy of non-intervention when the Greeks initially revolted, for they hoped that if the Sultan crushed the rebellion quickly, then Russia would not take advantage of the chaos to gain more land at the Ottomans' expense. However, the rebellion was now in year five, and every extra day it fought on increased Western fears that Russia would finally involve themselves, fears which were exacerbated when the geopolitically conservative Tsar Alexander I died in 1825 and was replaced by his much more ambitious brother Nicholas I, who immediately started putting the screws on Sultan Mahmud, forcing him to sign the Convention of Ackerman in October of 1826, which greatly increased Russian influence over the Ottoman-controlled Romanian principalities. This put the powers that be in Western Europe into political overdrive as they scrambled to ensure that Greece would not ultimately become a Russian-dominated satellite, as all Ottoman territories in Europe seemed on trajectory to be. Thus, Britain launched itself into Greek affairs, on the subtext of containing Russia and the pretext of stopping the still-at-large Ibrahim Pasha from carrying out an alleged barbarization project in which he supposedly intended to enslave and deport the Peloponnese's entire Christian population and replace them with Egyptian farmers. As it turned out, Britain and Russia would not have to butt heads over Greece. Largely due to the efforts of Foreign Secretary George Canning, the two superpowers came to an agreement in which, for the sake of global stability, they would jointly mediate the ongoing conflict between the Hellenes and the Sultan. France, meanwhile, had been initially reluctant, but soon also joined in on the negotiations. The ultimate result was the Treaty of London, signed on July 6, 1827. In it, the three greatest powers in Europe finally declared their official support for the Greek cause, sponsoring the creation of an internally autonomous Hellenic state, albeit one that would still pay tribute to and recognize as overlord the Sultan in Istanbul. The Treaty of London was engineered to be a conciliatory resolution for all parties involved. The Greeks would get their independence, albeit in a limited capacity, while the Ottomans would nominally maintain their territorial integrity. The Russians, who, per the Treaty of Kuchuk Kainaja, were the nominal protectors of all Orthodox Christians in the Ottoman Empire, would still be able to sink their claws of influence into this new Greek nation. Meanwhile, the British and French had seemingly solved their eastern question by preventing the Ottomans' collapse and containing Russian expansion, all while appeasing their ravenous Philhellene citizenry by aiding the Christian Greeks. There was only one problem. The Ottoman Sultan completely rejected the terms. The bluff had been called, and the powers of Europe would now either have to drop the matter or enforce their demands by might. They chose the latter, and so it was that in the summer of 1827, a joint Anglo-French and Russian fleet, composed of the finest warships in the world, sailed for the Ionian Sea. The Greek War of Independence was about to become an international war. In our next and final episode on the Greek War of Independence, we will cover the decisive naval battle of Navarino so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking and sharing, it helps immensely. 
Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.